Okay, so um, yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for including me in this uh, fantastic panel. And also I feel uh, really honored to be able to kind of uh, comment a little bit on the manifesto of Isabel and colleagues. Um, and I'll try to do it, um, I was thinking about, okay, what well, again, the approach. And I think that the way how I've been reading the book um, and perhaps in fact also I didn't read all, <laughs> but I read the most important part. Um, and I've been participating in a lot of the conferences that Isabel organized also in the European area. So the way how I approached it is, uh, okay, what this manifesto tells me from a more kind of sociological, but I would say also political and philosophical uh, perhaps uh, perspective. So first of all, thank you very much for writing this, uh, Isabel. And I think that this manifesto in fact uh, gives a very uh, truly real image of the challenges that we are uh, basically facing today in our society. Uh, just to mention a little bit, uh, finishing with the fa fascist uh, extreme right, the rays of extreme right wing uh, political coalitions which are in fact undermining social rights, uh, which are at the basis of the value of democracy. And I talk from you know, an Italian perspective where at the very moment we are really panicking um, and at the same time, you know, not uh, kind of losing the hope that things might uh, uh, suddenly change. Uh, also, of course, the disembeddedness uh, by using really uh, Karl Polanyi in terms of the social labor uh, from the economic, the market, uh, by the dismantling of any kind of social protections, which in fact have been guaranteed uh, through the social compromise. We all know we know about it, uh, the kind of raise of wage labor during the golden area of capitalism, and which in fact underpin the creation of, uh, or that you know, has been crystallized through the creation of the employment relationship, where in fact trade unions uh, played an important role, and which was in fact a kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 indication of the uh, how the process of democracy at that time went. And uh, last but not least, in fact, the um, environmental disaster, which is resulting from this aggressive and not absolutely democratic uh, capitalism, and which, uh, in fact, uh, some scholars, because of that, probably uh, a couple of since a couple of years ago, have been reflecting uh, and saying, well, probably ca capitalism has reached its end. Uh, now, I don't want to, to go much into that, but I want to start from this because, in fact, uh, you know, uh, going back to the political economy, and I'm sure many uh, of you here remember the book of uh, Wolfgang Streck, the analysis about how capitalism will end, uh, where, in fact, uh, Wolfgang Streck expressed the idea of this, uh, this kind of failing system where the marriage between democracy and capitalism um, was in fact uh, coming to an end. And I think that when Streck was writing this book, um, you know, other people, uh, other scholars were debating about the future of capitalism. And here particularly, I want to mention the book of Paul Collier, uh, who, uh, you know, really wrote about the future of capitalism uh, and where, uh, you know, in this book, he retains the same, uh, you know, kind of title and argued that not only capitalism, uh, might be abolished, but a better system can replace it. Uh, now, I think this is very important because to me, this means that, uh, you know, reading the manifesto and considering what is happening all around, we are still debating on the same questions. And the question remains, and it is, if a new capitalism, any, should replace the old one, how all these might or should look like? And this is, I think, to me, a very crucial question. Now, Colin Crouch, again, time ago, suggested that a fundamental challenge is not capitalism per se, eh, democratic capitalism, but is neoliberalism, and especially neoliberal capitalism, which is about, in fact, this free market idea that you know, is very much at the core of this manifesto. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it is you know, it, it really uh, focused on this kind of the dominance of the free economic logic of the market over the, over the public uh, life. And this is very important, um, I think, uh, particularly, and this is what the, you know, the book tells to me a lot in the sense of, you know, the way in which we need to substantially and concretely think, how can we map the course for experimenting better work? 
I think we need to, you know, perhaps rethink whether, uh, um, in fact, we should think about or go back to another form of capitalism or whether we want to absolutely abolish any form of uh, capitalism. So to me, in that sense, this manifesto uh, helped discerning the how by departing from a very crucial point, which was also mentioned by the pre previous people uh, before me, which is putting the voice of the workers at the center of the attention. But not only the voice of the workers, but also the voice of the families of those workers, which is also very important. So we, it is also important that we start to really considering work in a kind of more compelling way going as you know some sociologists or work would say you know across the boundaries of what is paid or considered being you know traditionally paid and unpaid and uh, particularly this is important also because uh, you know if we put the voice of the workers at the center we need to uh, think about putting also the kind of institutions which in fact kind of embed and protect uh, those uh, those workers, and these are the institutions, the, the institutions of industrial relations, the institutions which used to be uh, functioning uh, and which were protecting, in fact, workers within labor markets. And this to me is very important because what the manifesto tells me also, if we think in that way, is that we need to shift the kind of attention uh, when we look at trying to understand how to address the challenges that we are in fact facing today, in which I have uh, started by uh, talking about. So there is a kind of shift that we need to do from what is considered to be the pure economic side of the cause of those challenges and globalization technology. Well, these are important, but they don't tell us all. We need to shift the, the kind of attention from these kind of pure economic causes to what are the more social, political uh, kind of institutional uh, element uh, here, and here in fact the importance of industrial relations again and employment uh, institutions, which are at the center of all these. So um, at the end of the day, I think, and I agree, the voice of the workers means to empower. And uh, empowerment is in fact the word I have been you know, thinking when reading the manifesto, and empowering means to announce the capacities, the capabilities of individuals, of these workers, the family, in such a way to provide to them the means, so the resources and assets which are necessary to act, to decide, to make choices in workplaces, and labor markets, and also society uh, overall. And I say this, I want to stress society, because it is not only a labor market related issue what we are talking about, but it's more broadly also a no market and social related issue, especially if we consider the people who lack control over their own work, so they don't actually do jobs which are of good you know, quality and they cannot make decisions upon the conduct of their own work, are usually reported to be the ones who likely experience lack of uh, control also or in their own life, and whose conditions in terms of well-being, in terms of stress, for example, burnout, uh, are therefore more likely to be the worst. And you know, this is an interesting and important aspect also. And I think the research that particularly I've been conducting is in, since the last um, months uh, shows this very clearly, um, that in fact there are these consequences. Now, the question or the concept of empowerment for me is very, uh, you know, it's very powerful, it's very important. Um, and we do know that, you know, exists many, many people, many, Many uh, uh, scholars have been engaging in talking about ideas of empowerment and capabilities. For example, Amartya Sen, if I just think about one, uh, Alain Supio uh, from a more labor uh, um, uh, side, um, who, although you know, it doesn't speak directly about the idea of empowerment and workers' capability, but in any, any case, you know, engages with this idea uh, uh, of empowerment and also economists. Let's think about the uh, transitional labor market perspective, which was completely forgot. Well, he had a kind of auge a couple of uh, you know decades ago, <laughs> but now it's completely forgotten. Um, and who have been the people you know uh, really kind of uh, creating that kind of theory were economists, uh, such as for example Gunter Schmidt and Bernard Gazier. Uh, so 
in accordance to that, I mean, what we see here is, uh, you know, that uh, this idea of empowerment goes behind the observed uh, kind of preferences, if you would take it from an economic perspective, rational choice, or behaviors from a more social psychological perspective, and really focuses on what now, the narrative of some organizations, and particularly looking at the digital economy, they want to you know, refresh, which is this idea of the freedom. But the fact so we can have real freedom and we can attribute and give real freedom to people by empowering them, by making them capable to make their own choices. So that's also another interesting thing that I uh, uh, kind of came into my mind by uh, reading this book. But of course, we do know that uh, how far and how people can build uh, their own freedom is very limited. They cannot build their own freedom alone. And therefore, you know, in fact, if we look at, at the, you know, particularly um, issues related with precarious work, um, normally precarious work is conceived to be the outcome of a nil functioning labor market. So why do I say this here? Because to me, and there is also what I see in the manifesto as very, you know, powerful message. The message of this manifesto to me is that we need, in fact, to make the labor market, market functioning back again. We need to reinforce the institutions, the social institutions, which are at the core of the labor market, now collective bargaining, workers' participation, um, and also strategies uh, of unions organizing in workplaces where you know, unions have uh, most uh, 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 problems. And this is, in fact, the way in which, in which we can try to, now by using a kind of words which has already been used, um, equipping the markets for uh, the people rather than only equipping people for the market. And I think this is uh, what um, I would perhaps um, kind of uh, like to uh, close uh, my uh, speech today. Thank you for writing this.